and we're not going to have any law enforcement testify, right? Right. Okay, so I'll take that part out too. So, Mr. Hernandez, you would hand Mr. Harmon his most. And I did go through, Mr. Hernandez, and from your notice of mitigators, do them verbatim as I read them. So what we'll do is um, we'll bring the jury back in. You finish your cross. State finishes the redirect. We'll then take another break so I can uh, discuss the issue I need to discuss. And then we'll have our official charge conference, and then we'll begin immediately with the closing arguments. All right, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. Bring in the jury. Yes, ma'am. All rise, jury entering. I think you testified that prior to December 18th, you made $723 that was paid by the state for your uh, testimony as a state witness, correct? I have no idea. I know that it's been talked about, but I don't keep track of that. Okay. Uh, do you know, and I asked you specifically about two high-profile cases that you've been working on and testified in 2019. Correct, <laughs> yes. Uh, how much have you been paid for those cases? I have no idea. Uh, they both are state working for the state as an expert witness, correct? Yes, one in Pinellas and one here. Okay, can you, uh, when you say you have no idea, do you know if it's more than 20000 I have literally no idea because I don't keep track of that, but I know in Pinellas the rate that is charged is only $150 an hour, so it's the state rate. So I don't keep track of that. I literally do it every so often when I'm not as busy. So your testimony is you cannot give this jury any dollar figure, even approximate. I have no idea. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Doctor, you told us you're, making, you're being paid $300 an hour for your services in this case? $350 an hour. $350 an hour. Excuse me. Doctor, you went to medical school? Yes. And then you did a subspecialty in forensic psychiatry? Yes. And a fellowship in, in that? Yes. And that all took how many years to complete with your undergraduate? Oh, my, so my undergrad was four years, and my master's was two years, then medical school was four years, then residency was four years, and my fellowship was five years, or one year, so that's 15 years. 15 years to become a professional, or to get the professional qualifications to do the job you're doing, is that right? Yes. And then years of experience on top of that? My practice started in 2008, so it's been 11 years. Do you get paid by your... Um, your uh, clinical patients that you see? Of course, yeah. Do doctors get paid for their services? Yes. Do you expect to be paid for your services for forensic consultation in these cases? I hope so, yes. And the 700000 
dollars that you've made, has that been since 2008? Yes. So over 10 years doing cases and work is the accumulated amount. Yes. So roughly, if you divided it out, 70000 a year. Yes. And have some cases required more hour work. Of like course. More hours because of the amount of documents that you were given. Of course, yeah, it's different right. for every case. Do you select if a case is high profile? No. Do you determine if it becomes high profile? No. In the case where you talked about the Gucci shoes, you indicated that your uh, diagnosis of the defendant, or the def I'm sorry, the defense was that he was schizophrenic. Yes. And you were rebutting that by pointing out that he had paid attention to his dress and to his fashion style. I wasn't even really rebutting it. I, I was uh, an expert in looking at not guilty by reason of insanity of that offense. And when you're looking at that issue, you have to then look at the whole clinical picture. And part of the clinical picture was that people that have schizophrenia are very disorganized and very disheveled, typically. And this person was supposedly in the middle of a psychotic break when he attacked an elderly woman with a dog chain. So... They were saying he was floridly psychotic because this was schizophrenia, and that was not the case at all. The facts that you've testified about that you relied upon in this, in this case, those are not opinion. No. Correct? They're facts, right? Correct. And this manual up here that you've utilized, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical or St Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that is something used by neuropsychologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors. Everybody in mental health uses this in order to communicate uh, among each other. So we all know that when you say this, they have to meet a certain criteria. You can't just throw words around and say that somebody has PTSD or whatever without meeting the criteria. And so that's why this book is there. And that book is used, that is a um, scientifically reliable, accepted Objection, diagnostic statistical That's manual right. that's utilized by your profession and other mental health professionals. Yes, it's extensively researched in order to come up with this, and it comes up with revisions. This is the fifth edition, and it comes up with revisions every so often. And again, it's based upon research, uh, clinical research in that, and it's discussed throughout the manual. Right, and so before that was the DSM-4-TR, before that the, the DSM-4, and, and Correct. so on. Yes. And that's something that's been utilized in the field of mental health uh, for many, 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 many years. For correct? many years, yes. And that contains objective criteria objective. for your diagnosis? Uh, overall, go ahead. Correct. I mean, these are the criteria. These were not made up by me. I did not make up the criteria for antisocial personality disorder. These were already defined in this manual. And your opinion in this case, you didn't pull it out of thin, thin air, is that right? No, I did you, not pull it out of thin you air. You based it on several facts, including your evaluation of the defendant and other facts, correct? Correct. But the reality is your evaluation of the defendant is, per, is prescribed by statute and law, right, as far as when you have the availability to interview and evaluate the defendant. Yes. The first time you had availability was yesterday, correct? Correct, at 430. But even in light of that, do you have any reason in this case to want to order a PET scan of his brain? I would never have ordered that. Do you suspect that he has um, uh, dementia? No. Do you suspect that he has Alzheimer's? No. Or any other ailment that is properly diagnosed with PET scans? Correct. There is no neuropsychological disorder that he has that would indicate uh, the utilization of a PET scan. Do you, do you um, believe that he had some kind of a traumatic brain injury? Is there any big missing part of his head or with, with scars on his head where he suffered a gunshot wound or shrapnel? No, and I looked at that. I looked at that just as I looked at the scar on his back. I wanted to be sure that there was nothing there that would indicate that there was a serious injury because that would be a concern right. for me. And as far as the state relying upon you in their opening statements yesterday, again, you were provided 3,000 pages of documents yesterday morning, correct? Yes. Are you aware of any statutory restrictions on when they can provide those records to the state? I have no idea. I don't do the legal stuff. But yet, they decided to wait until yesterday morning, right at the beginning of the penalty phase, to provide us records. And those records, from what you reviewed, indicate they had them for months, correct? Oh, they obviously had them for months, yeah. But yet, they didn't give those to us for you to review in advance until yesterday. No, but I didn't know that they had to do that. Right. Now, you sat 
all through yesterday, you watched testimony, and you reviewed those records. Yes. I was killing myself. That's yeah. That's part of your work in this case. That's right. Is there anything in those records, is there anything in your interview with the defendant that radically changed any opinions you had of the defendant or this case based on the, the records you had involving, including uh, law enforcement reports, interviews, and so forth that we've talked about previously? No, uh, there was nothing earth-shattering in the interview, um, the, but the jail records were very important, so I'm glad I got those, and the employment records as well. All the records I got yesterday were very important. Now, you indicated that um, you have in the past in death penalty cases, you have agreed with certain aspects of defense experts. Of course, yes. Certain things that they arrived at. Yes. In their opinions. Similar diagnoses, yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Wu, you were here yesterday when Dr. Eisenstein indicated that he's also paid for what he does, right? Yes. Per hour. Yes, $200 an hour. And Dr. Wu charges for his hourly rates too. Yes, I don't know how much. Did you get his Did you get his deposition that we took two nights ago? No, I thought you just got did it last night. I last, didn't get that. Last night, I'm sorry, last night. You're yeah, right, last I didn't, night. I, he were dep deposing him as I was interviewing him. Would it surprise you to, to know it was two hundred twenty five, two hundred fifty dollars, depending on what he's doing? No. <clears throat> Have you been retained? Have you been retained by the defense in criminal cases? Of course, I have. Yes. Um, have you testified in penalty phase um, situations before penalty phase uh, trials, death penalty phases? I'm sorry, death penalty cases, penalty phase testimony, where Dr. Wu testified? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Is that several times? Yes. Has Dr. Wu ever testified that a defendant's brain was normal and there was no injury? No. So every case Dr. Wu has been, that you've seen, that he's testified in, the defendant always had a brain injury of some kind. Similar and consistent with CTE, as he talked about here. And his PowerPoint that he used in those cases, did he use similar slides? Yes. And was it as similarly long? Well, usually, this is the first time I've ever seen him in person. He's usually via satellite from like a Skype type of thing. I've never seen him in person until today. The uh, weight gain of the defendant, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that. Yes. You indicated a, a phenomenon called substance substitution. Yes. Did you believe he was substituting food for either sex or for drugs? Yeah, it was, I, I thought it was for sex. And to gain the weight, he had to have access to food, correct? Yes. Right. And were you aware of the fact that he was having money put into his canteen by Calissa Kelly? Yes. Did you find in your examination of this case that that allowed him to buy extra food? Oh, yeah. And they didn't talk about it in the medical record also, that he gets a lot of canteen and he had a bunch of stuff in there. And they were like, well, is that maybe why you're gaining weight? And he said, oh, yeah. And then also he's not working out as much as he used to. He used to play soccer before this. So he's not doing that anymore. So eating a lot of junk food and, and not working out has led to that. You indicated, or counsel to ask you about, you asking the defendant why he was so slow. Now, what did you mean by that? And what, was the, what were the circumstances of that statement? Well, he, I mean, he looked totally different from the police video so he was not answering my questions in a typical way I mean it, everything was slow and drawn out and it, it was atypical for number one what I've seen in the jail records they have not reported that slowing and number two what I've seen in the in the interrogation video so it was inconsistent so I was thinking maybe he was doing that to make me believe that he was slow that was how I was taking it which is why I then asked him about it okay all right you weren't insulting him no, I wasn't insulting him. 
And you meant, why was he reacting slowly? Yes. Was why was he going so slow? And, and, and in fact, at one point, he said that, you know, well, when is this going to be over? And I said, well, if you would speak faster, then it would go a little faster. I think that part of the reason it takes you so long to answer my questions. And he said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go faster. All right. Neuropsychological tests, including the MMPI, are ones that, as a clinician, you have to be able to interpret those, correct? Yes, and you're familiar with those as a forensic psychiatrist? Yes, and we use those all the time in my fellowship. The record um, in the medical records for the prescription of Vistarol that you were asked about by counsel, does the record indicate why it was being prescribed to the defendant? Yes, and I asked him about this also. But in the record, the, the jail record, it, he said he was having a hard time sleeping at night. And that's why he was prescribed that. He wasn't prescribed for anxiety. He was prescribed for sleepiness. But then he also reported that he's sleepy on Zoloft. So I said, well, why don't you just take your Zoloft that night? And he said, well, I need it during the day because I'll be depressed during the day if I don't take it in the morning, which is inconsistent with a true depression. And you also indicated there was a situation um, you were asking him about involving his work. I guess there was some kind of indication about him being a team player. Yes. And you asked him about female coworkers. Yes. So the team player part, was that he was a good team player or not a good team player? He was a good team player. And another thing, he was always at work on time. So it was just, I was just asking it partly just to wake him up a little bit, but partly just to find out, like, what was his interactions. My impression of reading those employment records was that, you know, when you are a team player and you're a go-getter and you go into work on time, why in the world are you not learning the system? Because they wanted him to move up at the company because they thought he had the abilities to do more. But he didn't want to do more. And that was the thing that continued. And finally, in the final evaluation before he left, that was evident. They reported that, that he is not responsible and he he doesn't follow through. And, and so that was, and I had asked... I asked the defendant about that, um, and he said, you know, you're right, because right after that, he had resigned. So I said, had you already sort of given up by that point? And he said, maybe I did, because he was then wanting to work in the cell towers. So they said, lacks initiative, maturity, and he is irresponsible. So that was his last review before he resigned, even when, though he has when, the ability. When was that, that he resigned? 2001. Did you, you were asked about this, did you see any need to render your opinion or make a diagnosis, did you see any need to order neuropsychological testing of the defendant? No.
Judge, I agree. By his father. And I wasn't clear on, or I don't recall testimony regarding him being absent. Well, there was a lot about in the video about him not being around and being at different houses, and so that part's fine. So five will read, Granville Ritchie suffered mental and physical abuse by his father, and Granville Ritchie's father was often absent because of order of the Okay. Um, all right, then the witness consideration factors. These are pretty much the standard ones. I don't, I don't know that there was any evidence of pressure or threat, but it's a standard one we normally leave in. So if you guys want me to take it out, I will. If you don't, just leave it in. We'd have to leave it in, Judge. Okay. Um, Bennett chose to remain silent. There were no law enforcement witnesses. There were no child witnesses. Um, then we've got the final rules for deliberation. So you're taking out the law enforcement witness one? Yep. Okay. Other than that, any requested corrections, additions, deletions? No, Judge. Did you guys have the verdict form? Yes. Okay. The verdict form should, um, the aggravating factors, victim is less than 12 years of age, first degree murder was committed while the defendant was engaged in the commission of sexual battery, first degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Question B has to do with the sufficiency of the aggravating factors as to count one. Then it tells them if they answer yes, to go to C, the mitigating, where the question is one or more individual jurors find that one or more mitigating circumstances was established by the greater weight of the evidence, yes or no. And then ask them to go to D, regardless of findings in C. Did the jury find unanimously or not that the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating circumstances established beyond a reasonable doubt? And then finally, proceed to E if they answer yes with regards to what their final verdict is. Any requested changes or corrections to the verdict? Form? The language under D, sufficiency of the aggravating factors, is the standard uh, aggravating factors plural? No, it's, well, it's, give, it's given as an option. It depends upon how many aggravating factors you have alleged. Right, uh, right. I'm just wondering whether it should read, we the jury management find that at least one aggravating factor is sufficient. So, defense, are you fine with that on the verdict form? Yes. I, I did. I'm fine with it. Okay. All right. So then I'll put that in B, reviewing the aggravating. I'll put parentheses around the S. And then I guess I do the same thing in D, right? Yes. Again, in E, in the second sentence, aggravating factors. Okay, other than those changes, any other requested changes to the verdict? All right, let me make those real quick. I'll print up a copy of the final jury instructions and the verdict form if you all wish to use it in your closing argument.
time to run your rest. Yeah, you do, because i got to print this stuff up. Okay. Okay, so one set of the final instructions for the state and the verdict form, and let me give you one for the defense. And then when the time comes, I'll have you pass out the jury the jury's copy. All right, with that, are we ready to proceed forward with the final arguments? Is that a yes? yes. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yes. You just give me one minute. Yes. Work. I want to make sure I have this in order. 